Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Michelle Uzetta. I'm the Deputy Legal Director at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Um, unfortunately, I learned this morning that my planned co-presenter, Diane Prado from Heart LA, is unable to join us today. She had to travel out of town unexpectedly. Um, for purposes of this webinar, the chat will be open to everyone, um, as will the Q&A. I'd ask that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will try to get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, if you just have basic information or experiences that you want to share with me and with other people on the webinar, um, go ahead and put that in the chat. I do want to encourage people to have an open discussion. I, I'm bad at multitasking, so I may not be able to monitor the chat at the same time as I'm presenting, um, which is why I'm asking you to put Q&A in the Q&A box. But you know, feel free to talk amongst yourselves while the presentation is ongoing. Um, next slide. Um, before I go into the agenda, for those who may not know, uh, DREDF is a national law and policy center focusing on the rights of people with disabilities and where disabilities intersect with other uh, marginalized identities. Um, we are also a support center for qualified legal services providers in California. So we are here to answer your questions on an ongoing basis when disability issues come up in the work that you are doing. Uh, so for today's presentation, I'm going to provide a brief overview of fair housing laws that protect the right of people with disabilities to reside with assistance animals. Some of this may be old news to you. You may have already attended trainings on this issue. You may be already familiar, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody that's here has a common base for proceeding to the next section of the agenda, which will be to talk about some current challenges when working with people who use assistance animals and specifically pet screening, um, the use of pet addendums, and AB 468. Next slide. So both the Federal Fair Housing Act and California's Fair Employment and Housing Act make it unlawful for housing providers to refuse to make what they call reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities uh, when such accommodations are needed to have equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. A very common request that housing providers receive is for the reasonable accommodation uh, to waive a housing provider's no pet policy so that a person who uses an assistance animal can reside with their assistance animal. Next slide. The term assistance animal is similar under both the Fair Housing Act and California's Fair Employment and Housing Act. Um, an assistance animal is an animal that works, provides assistance, or performs tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability, or an animal that provides emotional support for a person with a disability. Um, in some other legal contexts, these terms may be divided up into service animal and emotional support animal. But under fair housing law, they're just all kind of lumped together. Uh, under the general term of assistance animal. And it's important to note, as I do on the bottom of this slide, that assistance animals are not legally considered pets. Next slide. Um, in order for an animal to qualify as an assistance animal, special training is not required, but there does have to be some kind of a nexus or connection between the individual's disability and the assistance that the animal provides. Um, so an animal that picks up items for somebody who's unable to bend, or an animal that goes in and turns on lights in a room that's dark for somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder to avoid having any kind of flashbacks or things like that. That's the type of thing we're talking about. There has to be a connection between what the animal does um, and the person's disability-related needs. There's no legal requirement that an animal would be registered or certified as an emotional support or service animal, assistance animal. Um, those types of things are not required. And businesses, especially online businesses that claim to register or certify assistance animals are charging people for a service that's unnecessary to establish the need of a reasonable accommodation. 
um, those types of certifications don't really have any legal standing or um, merits if you're doing advocacy on behalf of, of a client. Next slide. Um, when assessing whether somebody should have the reason of reasonable accommodation of an assistance animal, there are certain questions that housing providers can add and ask and information that they can't ask for. Um, if you're talking about a service animal, which is again, a person, a animal that's trained to perform some sort of work or tasks related to somebody's disability. You can ask, are you an individual with a disability? And what is the disability related task your animal has been trained to perform? Uh, housing providers cannot ask individuals for their specific diagnosis. And they also cannot ask for someone to have their dog demonstrate or their animal demonstrate the task or work that they're able to perform. Um, and reliable disability related information can be requested if the person's disability is not obvious. So if a person has post-traumatic stress disorder that's not obvious to a housing provider, they can ask for disability related information um, to show that the person has a disability. Again, not entitled to the specific diagnosis, but they are entitled to at least confirmation that the person has a disability and a need for um, a service animal. Uh, when you're dealing with requests for support animals, similar questions can be asked uh, and the housing providers are looking again at whether or not the tenant has a disability, whether the support animal requested is necessary and reasonable, whether there's a connection between the disability and that request. Um, and a special note here that uh, vests, identification cards, and certificates, and again, we're talking about these businesses that kind of market these things online, are not in and of themselves documentation that shows either a disability or a need for reasonable accommodation. Those are more questionable things um, at this point in time. Next slide. Housing providers cannot require tenants to pay pet fees, additional rent, or any other kind of fee. Um, including additional security deposits or to pay for liability insurance. Uh, those types of things are not allowed under fair housing law. And again, this is because assistance animals are not considered pets. A housing provider can, however, charge a tenant for damage that an assistance animal causes above normal wear and tear if it's the provider's usual practice to bill tenants for that type of thing. Next slide. Uh, pet rules or restrictions that a housing provider may have will not apply to service and support animals or assistance animals, uh, again, because they are not considered pets. Uh, housing providers may not limit the breed or size of a dog used as an assistance animal. And housing providers um, they can limit access based on specific issues with a specific animal's conduct, uh, meaning the animal at issue is causing a direct threat or fundamentally altering the provider's services. Um, but that doesn't, that really doesn't come up too often, um, but that does have to be an individualized assessment of the specific animal in question. And we'll get to uh, a little discussion about direct threat later in the presentation. Next slide. Uh, sometimes people will call wanting to have more than one assistance animal. There's no rule that you're limited to one assistance animal. So somebody in theory could have more than one. However, each animal must be individually determined to meet the requirements for an assistance animal. Uh, so, for example, somebody may have uh, a mental health disability that requires a support animal, something like depression, um, and they may also have coexisting physical disabilities that require an assistance animal to help them with picking up items or helping them get uh, up from a, a sitting position to a standing position. Um, 
I, I thank you, Santos, for raising your hand. If you could put questions in the Q and A box, I'm I'm not going to be able to answer questions during the presentation, but I can get to your question after. Um, when you have more than one service animal, the cumulative impact of having multiple animals may be considered by a housing provider if they're assessing whether there's an undue burden on their um, on their their housing. Um, next slide. Uh, I think it may have skipped a slide. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, one important thing to note is that when housing providers are considering a request for an assistance animal, um, it is encouraged under federal law and required under state law that the housing provider engage in an interactive process. This slide here deals with the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, before denying a reasonable accommodation request due to lack of information that confirms an individual's disability or their disability-related need for an assistance animal, the housing provider is encouraged to engage in a good faith dialogue. A couple of cases to note here, Howard versus HMK Holdings is a Ninth Circuit case that established that there's no standalone liability for the failure of a housing provider to engage in an interactive process. Um, however, that case does not hold that uh, the interactive process is not encouraged or something to be considered. Rodriguez v. Morgan is a case out of the Central District of California um, that makes clear that the failure to engage in an interactive process is a factor that can be considered when you're evaluating whether or not a housing provider has failed to reasonably accommodate someone. Um, so it's still something you push for. And the joint statement on reasonable accommodations from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Justice uses language like should in determining the interactive process. So it's something that those administrative governmental agencies view as also important for a housing provider. Next slide. Under California law, the interactive process is required um, and it's always been required. However, um, amendments to the, the regulations under the Fair Employment and Housing Act that went into effect January 2020 clarify and make very clear that it's required. Um, under FEHA, housing providers must engage with a requester or their representative. Uh, the purpose is to exchange information to identify, evaluate, and implement accommodations or modifications. Uh, the interact in, during the interactive process, a housing provider may not insist on specific types of evidence. A medical exam cannot be required. And if a housing provider believes that a requester's request for accommodation or modification can't be granted, the provider must engage in the interactive process to determine if there's an alternative that's feasible and then provide that. And the citation for that regulation is on the slide. Next slide. There are some certain situations when an assistance dog can be excluded. Um, these are, you know, when the animal would impose an undue financial or administrative burden, never seen that come up, um, or would fundamentally alter the nature of the housing programs or services. And uh, honestly, in 30 years, I've never seen that come up either. Um, you can also exclude a assistance animal if the specific animal in question poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others that can't be reduced or eliminated by the provision of another accommodation. Or if the specific animal would cause substantial physical damage to the property of others that cannot be reduced or eliminated by the provision of another accommodation. Next slide. So these are just um, definitions of what the terms undue financial or administrative burden and fundamental alteration mean. Uh, when you're looking at undue financial or administrative burden, you're really looking at the cost of providing the accommodation requested, the benefit that's conveyed to the tenant, the financial resources of the provider, 
uh, and the availability of equally effective, less expensive alternatives. Um, again, I've never seen an undue financial or administrative burden come up in a assistance animal case. It just isn't something that I've seen. Um, others may have. I'd encourage people to put it in the chat if they have. Um, same with fundamental alteration. That usually doesn't come up when you're dealing with assistance dogs cases. What fundamental alteration means is that the request is going to alter the essential nature of the housing provider's operations. Next slide. Um, so when you're talking about direct threat, how that's defined is a significant risk of bodily harm or a risk of substantial physical damage to the property of others. Um, and that those kinds of harms or risks can't be sufficiently mitigated or eliminated by a reasonable accommodation. Next slide. When assessing direct threat, there's a number of factors that you're considering. Um, the first is the nature, duration, and severity of the risk. The second is the likelihood that the threat will actually occur. occur <laughs> sorry. And then the third is whether there are reasonable accommodations that will sufficiently mitigate or eliminate um, the direct threat. Next. Uh, I think as I already mentioned, an individualized assessment is required uh, of the, the particular animal in question. And the assessment must also rely on objective evidence about the specific animal. Uh, you can't just rely on stereotypes about certain breeds, certain size animals, or just animals in general. It really has to be an indiv individualized assessment um, that looks at the specific animal in question. It has to be based on real evidence, not just subjective fears or speculations. Next slide. Um, and finally, Assistance animals, you know, where are they allowed? They're allowed in all areas of housing, common areas and units, unless, again, there's a reason, a valid legal reason for exclusion, like the undue burden or for fun fundamental alteration of the provider services. Um, so they're allowed pretty much everywhere. Next slide. All right, so moving on to current challenges. Uh, next slide. The first thing I wanted to discuss was pet screening. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that term, pet screening is essentially a background, a background check on a tenant's pet dog, cat, or other animal. And it is a way for landlords to gather information about a prospective tenant's pet prior to approving their rental application or prior to an existing tenant moving in a new pet. Next slide. The types of information that are often sought through pet screening include the pet's breed, size, weight, gender, and age, how long the tenant has owned the pet, whether the pet is housebroken, the amount of time the pet will be home alone every day, the pet's medical history, including vaccinations, health issues, the name of the pet's veterinarian, a history of any behavioral problems, such as noise complaints, aggression, or biting, and even references from other landlords specific to the pet. Next slide. Uh, many landlords will do pet screening themselves by asking tenants questions during the application process or by having tenants fill out a pet application. Um, but it's also now common and growing uh, and growing that landlords will use a third party screening company to do the screening for them. And I know on some of the listservs, people have been discussing petscreening.com. That's one example of a, spet, of a pet screening company that a number of housing providers, uh, especially large housing providers, are using to screen pets. And those type of third-party companies uh, have websites. Tenants are instructed to create an online profile with that company. 
fill out a bunch of forms, answer a number of questions, and then have to wait to see if their pet is approved. Next slide. So then begs the question, can a landlord require pet screening for assistance animals? Um, and the answer I would provide is no. Uh, landlords cannot require pet screening for assistance animals. Assistance animals are not pets. Um, and people with disabilities who use assistance animals can live with those animals as a reasonable accommodation. Um, because assistance animals are not pets, they aren't subject to the same rules and requirements as pets, including something like pet screening. And it's our position at DREDF, and I know another a, a number of you all also feel this way, that pet screening for assistance animals violates fair housing law. Next slide. So I wanted, I have a couple of slides here to talk about some of the issues that we're seeing with pet screening and why we feel like pet screening companies violate fair housing law. Um, the first is that fair housing law is very clear that reasonable accommodations cannot be conditioned on the execution of additional documents. So if a tenant is being asked to go online, create an account, fill out a bunch of forms, jump through a bunch of hoops, provide a bunch of information, that violates these aspects of fair housing law. Fair housing law is also very clear that requests for reasonable accommodations need not be made in a particular manner. Um, so forcing somebody to create an online profile and fill out forms to request an accommodation would violate those types of provisions as well. People with disabilities should be able to request verbally um, that they be accommodated in such a way. Next slide. Additionally, some pet screening companies, and this is certainly true of petscreening.com, require that tenants agree to conditions and terms like a waiver of liability and mandatory arbitration. Um, those terms are required in order for you to fill out the forms that they have. Um, so in order to go through the and complete the pet screening uh, process, you have you or you're given no choice. You have to agree to the waiver of liability and mandatory arbitration. Um, and under fair housing law, a, a housing provider cannot condition approval of an accommodation on an agreement to special terms or conditions. So asking people to waive liability or participate and agree to mandatory arbitration would violate these provisions of law. Next page. Uh, lastly, pet screening companies often ask tenants for information that's not necessary to process a request for an assistance animal. Uh, so I've seen that they've asked for tenants specific diagnoses. They've asked for unnecessary medical records. Uh, oftentimes they ask for the animal's breed or size, which is something that is supposed to be irrelevant when you're talking about a reasonable accommodation. Um, they ask for photos, vaccination records, and microchip information. Those are all things that are not required in order for you to request an accommodation and be granted an accommodation of an assistance animal. None of the information is required. Um, and in fact, some of the information is unlawful or, or at a minimum inconsistent, inconsistent with HUD and DOJ guidance on assistance animals and how to process requests for assistance animals. Next page. So what can someone do if they're asked to complete pet screening as a condition of, um, or as part of having their accommodation request processed? Uh, we'd suggest explaining to the landlord that the animal is an assistance animal and can't be subject to pet screening. Um, I've had a number of clients for whom that has worked. Uh, share resources with the landlord, ed you know, educate them. Um, about why this kind of practice violates fair housing law. Um, and then if the housing provider is unwilling um, to, to waive that pet screening process or consider the accommodation in some other way, you have the, the um, opportunity to file a complaint with the Civil Rights Department. Um, you could also file a complaint with HUD. Uh, you could call advocates, some of whom are on this call. Um, to help with navigating that process. Next slide. 
Um, moving on from pet screening to pet addendums. Uh, California law permits housing providers to establish terms in a lease or rental agreement that reasonably regulate the presence of guide dogs, signal dogs, or service dogs on the premises of a housing provider. Um, and that's found at California Civil Code 54.1B6B. Um, I'll note that this is part of a law called the Disabled Persons Act. It is not a provision that's found in the Fair Employment and Housing Act, and it does not address um, emotional support animals. Um, so just flagging that. Um, we would argue that this state law provision is preempted by the Fair Housing Act because the Fair Housing Act prohibits accommodations for being conditioned on the execution of additional documents and or an agreement to additional terms and conditions. Um, but I have not yet seen this be challenged. I've asked folks at CRD for their opinion on this provision of state law and not received a response. Um, but it's it would be my take that this is not something that uh, that it, putting terms in a lease or in a rental agreement or asking for an addendum is something that's not permitted. It it violates fair housing law, federal fa fair housing law. Next slide. Um, under the California Fair Employment and Housing Act regulations, uh, they talk about reasonable conditions and how reasonable conditions may be imposed on the use of an assistance animal. Um, I'll note that the FEHA regulations don't say anything about putting those reasonable conditions in a lease um, like the Disabled Persons Act provision does. It just kind of puts out there that the landlord can impose reasonable conditions. And some examples include restrictions on waste disposal and nuisance behavior. And those are just kind of common sense type of conditions that apply um, to owners of assistance animals. Um, any conditions that are imposed cannot interfere with the normal performance of the assistance animals duties. Um, so for example, a leash, a leash requirement may sometimes interfere with the ability of a dog to assist an individual, um, in which case it's okay for the animal to be under voice control or otherwise under the handler's control. Um, as another example, a no noise requirement, um, that's a strict no noise requirement, may interfere with a dog whose job it is to bark to, al to alert somebody who is blind to a danger or when somebody's at the door. I mean, you would compare and contrast that with a dog that's barking all day or all night um, when the barking is not related to its duties. Um, that kind of behavior may violate kind of nuisance requirements. Next slide. Um, handlers of assistance animals do have certain responsibilities uh, like feeding, maintaining, providing veterinary care, and controlling their assistance animal. Um, the, the individual can do this on their own or with the assistance of family, friends, personal care, attendants, volunteers. Um, and these are responsibilities that exist regardless of lease terms. Next slide. Some of the problems with that we see with pet addendums, um, oftentimes they subject assistance dog users to terms and conditions that are applied to tenants with pets. Um, this may be things like pet deposits, uh, things of that nature. And those are really terms that should not apply to an individual who uses an assistance dog. Because again, assistance, do assistance dogs should be viewed almost at like a piece of equipment, like a wheelchair or a walker. They're there to assist the person with a disability. It's not the same as a common pet. Pet addendums often also contain unreasonable or unwarranted terms. So you wanna be really careful when you're advising a client to look at what a housing provider is asking them to sign. Um, the addendums may also waive some rights, including due process or notice rights. Um, next slide. I have a couple of examples. Uh, this may be hard to see. It's hard for me to see. Um, 
me make my screen bigger. So here's an example. This is the um, service animal agreement. It's a it's like a template that's used by the Apartment Association of America, um, and it has it has some terms. Sorry, it has some terms that are not great and that um, I would argue violate fair housing law. Um, things like number two, which I highlighted here, that the assistance animal must be properly licensed and have shots and vaccinations. Um, although assistance animals are subject to local government regulations, like if you have to have a license for any animal, that is going to apply to your assistance animal. Um, if there's requirements around vaccinations, then that's something that an assistance animal owner has to comply with. However, to make it part of a person's lease agreement um, and make your ability to maintain your housing contingent on these things is not, uh, is not right. Um, housing providers are not the people who enforce those type of things. Um, so we would push back against those kind of requirements being in an animal agreement because a housing provider should not be able to notice you for eviction because your vaccinations are out of date doesn't make any sense. Um, moving down to number eight, any animal waste that may be that may accumulate inside a tray inside the unit will be disposed of properly and promptly. I mean, what does that even mean? And how how is a housing provider supposed to en enforce that? Um, that seems like a housing provider inappropriately trying to regulate somebody's housekeeping. Because um, I, I imagine somebody with uh, an emotional support cat. Is the housing provider really going to come in to see how often that they, you know, change the litter box? Um, is that really something that you may risk eviction on? Doesn't make sense. Um, number nine, you know, there's a lot of provisions in these kind of agreements that have to do with indemnifying uh, the housing provider from any kind of uh, liability for injury or property damage. Um, those types of terms also are inappropriate for an accommodation request. Um, and then, the, you know, moving down to number 12, if you're going to leave your animal alone or uh, unattended for more than 24 hours, uh, provided providing that the housing provider can come in, you know, without notice, um, seize the animal and turn it over to authorities that has all sorts of notice and due process uh, issues and concerns written all over it. Um, people may leave their animal alone for more than 24 hours, but have somebody who comes in and feeds it. And, you know, especially for people who may have um, a history or frequency of hospitalizations um, where they don't bring their animal with them, but they have family members or friends who check in every day or so. Um, so those types of terms just are really concerning and really inappropriate. Um, next slide. Here's another example that's even more egregious. <laughs> um, up at the top, you know, this housing provider is asking for type or breed. That's really not information that should be considered. So it, it's kind of, why are you asking for that to be on here? Um, they're asking that the there be confirmation that the animal is spayed, neutered, and that there's a vet authorization. Again, that's not a housing provider's uh, role. Um, no limit on liability, that's problematic. Um, all service animals must be kenneled when the resident is away from their home. Highly problematic. If somebody has an emotional support animal, um, the animal is most likely not going to be allowed at that person's workplace. So this housing provider is then making a term of the lease agreement that the resident, whenever they're at work, have their animal in a kennel within their own home rather than free to roam throughout the home. That is a violation of fair housing rights. Um, resident shall not permit the, the assistance animal in other apartments, laundry room, office, et cetera, that violates a person's ability and right to have their assistance dog accompany them to all areas open to the public in their housing. So that provision is, is also illegal. Um, 
spayed or neutered. We talked about that already. Um, and then inspections. I'm sorry, I, I, my glasses are not strong enough to read this small print, um, but you get the gist. These are all the types of things that you may see in service animal agreements that potentially violate the law, the fair housing law, and you should push, uh, push up against. Um, next slide. Okay, finally talking about a California Assembly Bill 468. Next slide. So AB 468 is an assembly bill that was enacted in 2021. Um, the bill was co-sponsored by Guide Dogs for the Blind and Canine Companions. It is a bill that flew under most of our radar. Um, it was, it's, was aimed towards curbing perceived issues with emotional support animals in public spaces, um, fraudulent emotional support animals, I should say. Um, what it, it does two things, two main things. It requires a business selling emotional support dogs and or emotional support animal vest tags or certifications to notify buyers that an ESA is not specifically trained to be a service dog and is not entitled to the rights and privileges accorded by law to service dogs. So I, you know, it's a poorly, I, I'll say, I think it's a poorly written bill um, and it is part of the health and safety code now. It, it's hard to understand. Um, this, I imagine, was intended to dissuade businesses that sell items like certifications, vests, and tags uh, to make them think twice about doing that um, because a lot of these businesses kind of put those out there without checking that dogs are legitimate, I guess. Um, and then the second thing it, that the bill does, which is of most concern to housing advocates, is that it places conditions on healthcare practitioners providing documentation relating to an individual's need for an emotional support dog. Um, and the site for where AB 468 is now located is health and safety code sections 122317 through 122318. Um, next slide. A couple of things to note, um, the plain language of the bill and the statute where it's uh, present now, uh, it's limited to emotional support dogs. So it doesn't apply to service dogs and it doesn't apply to other types of emotional support animals. Um, and also the plain language of the statute limits its obligations or requirements to healthcare practitioners. Um, which is something that's specifically defined under the law. They're licensed and regulated folks um, regulated pursuant to a certain part of the business and professions code. Next slide. Um, so specifically what the bill provides on documentation, uh, it states that a healthcare practitioner may not provide documentation relating to an individual's need for an emotional support dog unless they meet certain criteria. Um, and those criteria are that the person possess a valid active license, that they're licensed to provide professional services within the scope of the license and the jurisdiction in which the documentation is being provided, um, that they establish a client provider relationship with the individual for at least 30 days prior to providing the documentation for the emotional support dog. And there is a carved out exception for people who are unhoused. Um, and then that they complete a clinical evaluation of the individual prior to giving documentation and support of the emotional support dog. Next slide. So then the question for housing advocates is how does AB 468 impact fair housing rights? And the answer is it shouldn't. I used to say it doesn't. Now I just say it shouldn't because it does in unintended ways. Um, AB 468 does not, by its own language, restrict or change existing federal and state law relating to a person's right for accommodations and equal access to housing. So it shouldn't apply in situations where you're talking about someone needing an assistance animal in housing. Next slide. AB, um, 
AB 468 also, in my opinion, conflicts with state and federal fair housing law. So that, you know, despite the carve out in the language of the bill itself, it, it conflicts with state and federal fair housing law. Um, and there's a couple of sites here. It's, it would be invalid because it's preempted by the purposes and the plain language of the Fair Housing Act. Um, and then accordingly, it would be also invalid under our state law. Um, our state law regulations do not cross-reference that code section, uh, the Health and Safety Code where AB 468 was enacted. And um, our federal, our, our state laws are far more flexible on what is required to establish the need for an accommodation. It's not required that people go to a healthcare practitioner. They can get documentation of disability and need from a social worker, from documentation having to do with um, so receipt of disability benefits, from peer support groups, from non-medical providers, or any other reliable third party. Next slide. And the Civil Rights uh, Department, the State Civil Rights Department, has also, you know, put out materials that stress uh, that AB 468 does not apply to housing. Um, in their Emotional Support Animals and Fair Housing Law publication, and there's a link there, at question 13, they clarify that FIHA invalidates any state law to the extent it purports to require or permit any unlawful housing discrimination, including the denial, the denial of reasonable accommodations. Um, therefore, housing providers must allow reasonable accommodations for emotional support animals under the rules described and cited uh, in their frequently asked questions, which refers to the state law um, regulations on assistance animals, including existing rules regarding what type of documentation can establish one's disability um, and disability related need for an emotional support animal, which again is broader than a healthcare practitioner. It includes things like social workers, family members, um, non medical providers. Next slide. Some of the issues created by AB 468 that come up in the housing context. Um, despite the carve out in the statute, healthcare providers have been more reluctant to provide verification for emotional support dogs since this law has gone into effect. Um, and people have raised that a number of times on the listserv. Um, advocates are encountering situations where an individual has a legitimate need for an emotional support dog, but has no have no access to a healthcare provider that's willing to provide a verification. Next slide. So some strategies for navigating those issues. Um, educate and advocate with healthcare practitioners to kind of alleviate any fears that they have that they may be violating the law when you're dealing with assistance dogs in the housing context. I know that that's hard, but that's what we have to try to do. Um, be flexible and creative in, in gathering documentation. Uh, for example, and we mentioned this already, confirmation of disability can come from a large number of other resources like peer support groups, non-medical service agencies, any reliable, other reliable third party. Um, and you can also refer to uh, the federal fair housing and equal opportunity notice. I, I provide a link to that. Um, information about disability may include a determination from a government agency like Social Security that somebody is receiving disability benefits or eligible for disability related housing. Uh, or receive any kind of a subsidy or voucher that is based specifically on disability. Um, there's also the possibility that advocates can launch some kind of legislative or legal challenge um, to this provision. Because one thing I'll note is that, you know, it was supported by Guide Dogs for the Blind and Canine Companions, but it really does not solve any issue with with regard to fake emotional support animals in the marketplace. 
Um, my sense is that this was enacted to deal with that issue, like people going into stores and restaurants um, claiming pets to be emotional support animals and the frustration you know, rightfully so, the frustration that that caused people and particularly people in the blind community um, who who then get some of the flack about animals in the marketplace. Um, but neither federal law nor state law recognize a right to have your emotional support animal in those types of public spaces. Um, so this law really doesn't get to them at all. Um, it just creates a, a lot of headaches for the rest of us who have to then deal with these unintended consequences of medical providers being really, really reluctant um, to support an individual in asking for an accommodation. Um, that's the last slide in the presentation. I see that there's a number of questions and that there's also people um, talking in the chat. I wanted to know if people had other experiences or ideas um, about dealing with the AB 468 issue in the housing context, or just generally sharing experiences with um, you know, pet addendums and pet screening and things like that. Um, but let me let me look at the, I think we can stop the recording here and then I'll go on to Q and A.